In the days of the early explorers, a trip to Dubbo would have taken weeks, maybe months. Today, it's less than an hour to the nearest major capital. But it's not my final destination. I'm on a path that'll take me into the mountains and up to the stars. In 1818, the explorer John Oxley saw these mountains, set of them most stupendous, and promptly called them the Arbuthnot Range. Arbuthnot. Thankfully, we've settled for a much better name, the Warren Bungles, which is a local indigenous word meaning crooked mountains. And don't they make for a fabulous landscape? Like a row of bad teeth gnashing at a big sky. I'm climbing 1,100 metres above sea level to siding springs in the Warram Bungle Ranges, home to an enormous and magnificent scientific instrument, the world-renowned Anglo-Australian Telescope. After testing sites all over the country, the Australian National University selected the Warram Bungle Ranges because of its high elevation, low humidity, and a 70% average of cloudless night skies. There are a total of 12 telescopes here, with a visitor centre and public access to the viewing gallery of the main telescope. For thousands of years, the night sky has inspired explorers, scientists, dreamers, romantics, poets. And here in Australia, we are blessed with buckets of the stuff. We've got enormous expanses of gorgeous silky emptiness, vast havens of silky blackness, just the kind of stuff that causes the eyepiece of an astronomer's telescope to fog. As night falls, the mountain bristles with quiet activity. The stars come out, and so do the astronomers. I'm going to meet a distinguished professor of astronomy, Frederick Garnet Watson AM. But around here, everyone just calls him Fred. Fred, I'm thrilled to see that you've got a telescope here because I'm sure I read on the AAT website a sentence that said, today, professional astronomers never look through telescopes. This must not go beyond these four walls, David, but I love looking through telescopes. It's why I became an astronomer in the first place, because I like looking through them. Until 100 years ago, astronomers made discoveries simply by looking through telescopes, uh, but then they discovered ways of making the telescopes more sensitive that eliminated the human eyes from the process. Right. And so now what we use are high-tech uh, pieces of equipment, gadgets that actually allow us to record the light and analyse it, sift it for its rainbow spectrum colours and make discoveries that way. The four-metre mirror at the base of the scope concentrates distant light from stars, up to 400 at a time, into a beam that can be analysed for information that is simply and stunningly mind-boggling. And so, as the clouds above us finally clear, the southern sky unwraps itself like a gift from Galileo himself. So what are we looking at tonight? So the whole sky is like a, a map to people who know their way around it. And the easiest way in Australia to find your way around the sky is first of all to look for the Southern Cross. Up here are the two pointers, one above the other, pointing towards the cross, which is right there. And the cross tells you the way to find the south pole of the sky. Ah, oh, there it is, yeah. So what is happening with the Anglo-Australian Telescope? What, do you, what are you looking for? Some of the things that the Anglo-Australian Telescope is noted for are things like the discovery of planets orbiting other stars. Uh, we know of something like two or 3,000 now of these planets going around other stars, and about 8% of them have been discovered here at the Anglo-Australian Telescope. The, the other big question is, are we alone, I suppose? That's the other big question, yeah, the third of the big question. So are we alone? Well, we don't know yet. Um, will, we, will you discover that through this? You never know.
Righto. If I just had one tip to impart to all you four-wheel drivers and caravanners, is to understand the correct tyre pressures for your touring setup. Now, why is this? Well, tyres are expensive, and not running the correct pressures could lead to early wear and tear, or worse, a potentially dangerous blowout. Now, the best way to understand all this is to test your tyre pressures when the air inside is cold, and again when it's hot, say after a good long stint down the freeway. These tyres, they're at about 34 psi. Now, as the caravan and the four-wheel drive go down the freeway, the air inside will expand as it heats up, and at the end of it all, we should see a pressure increase of five or six psi for light truck tyres and four psi for passenger tyres. That's the ideal scenario. Now, if you see a pressure increase of more than these numbers, then your starting pressure was too low. But if the pressure increases by less, then your starting pressure was too high really easy. The best bit is that this rule applies equally to caravans and four-wheel drives. A portable air pressure gauge is an essential bit of kit for every caravanner. I use this ARB number and I find it very useful. And remember our website, agadventures.com.au, has all the latest caravanning and four-wheel driving information ready and waiting for you to discover. Coming up next, the life and crimes of Dubbo's notorious old jail.